As the famine continues, aid trucks are unable to get through due to warlords in the area. But what I want to know is where is God when people are dying? The war in Ukraine continues to rage on with no end in sight. Record flooding levels. A record number of wildfires. A record heat wave. You know, Christians tend to be judgmental hypocrites. I don't see love or compassion. Chaos in the streets following the trial of the election with results coming in in key precincts. It People say that happened. everything happens for a reason. Really? That was terrible. Did God really want that to happen to me? Good morning and welcome to Christ Church. We are a church about lifting lives, elevating Christ, a church for those who aren't here yet. My name is Pastor Mike and it is so good to be with you in worship, whether you're here in the East Auditorium, whether you're in West or you're joining us online this morning. It is good for us to be together. This whole month of October, we have been in a series called Everything Happens for a Reason, right? in which we have talked about this phrase that we sometimes hear from culture, sometimes around God's plan for us or God's intentions, and sometimes it makes us question, does everything in fact happen for a reason? And one of the reasons why we are asking this question is because we know that bad theology hurts people badly, that the things that we say have a effect on people, and sometimes when we misrepresent God to other people, sometimes that can bring uh, added pain into people's life who are already suffering. And so we've been talking about how we utilize this phrase in relationship to natural disasters, to our politics, and today we'll um, finish up with talking about sickness. Before we get there, uh, I want to invite you back to next week, since this series has kind of been really heavy, as you noticed from that bumper video. Uh, next week, we're bringing a little bit more levity uh, and tackling a series called, Wait, That's in the Bible? In which we talk about the stories that some you might be familiar with, some you may not, but some of the weirder stories that make you think, wait, how is that in the Bible? And so Vicar Nathan and Pastor Andrew are going to be walking us through that series. But today, we have to talk about the question of what, uh, what do we say uh, in the midst of sickness? And when we use this theology of everything happens for a reason. That this is one of the phrases that we deploy, and sometimes it's not that specific phrase that everything happens for a reason, but sometimes it comes out in different ways. That sometimes we say that, well, God has a plan and we just don't know it. Sometimes we'll say stuff like, God only tests his toughest soldiers as a way of trying to make people feel better in the midst of their suffering. And so always we seem to be reaching for this question and our first intuition whenever anybody gets sick is to ask why. Why did this happen? To find some sort of reason or justification to help us understand why is this happening to someone I love or is it happening to me? And I think part of the reason why we instantly go to this question of asking why is that we actually, we derive some sort of comfort when the answer seems obvious, when we can rationalize away something that happens that maybe isn't so good. And so uh, in cases where it is obvious that, well, the person themselves kind of brought them on, brought this sickness on themselves, that actually brings us comfort to rationalize that. Like, I recently did a funeral for a man who died of uh, liver failure. And, you know, for some people, it might be comforting to think, well, that couldn't happen to me because I didn't drink as much as he did. And the problem with that thinking is that we all engage in certain things that deteriorate our bodies and make us sick. That I know that someday when people go to bury me, they will say, here lies Mike who lived a long and fruitful life, and it would have been longer if he would have drank less Mountain Dew. Um, but we also derive a certain amount of comfort when it seems like it is somebody else's fault. That for somebody who gets lung cancer, who may not have been a smoker themselves, but grew up in a home where their mom or dad smoked two packs a day, we can say, well, maybe it wasn't their fault, but it was somebody else's fault. It was a human fault. But sometimes it gets really uncomfortable when the reason is not obvious. 
what do we say and how do we respond when people get sick and are suffering and we don't know the reason why? How do we justify and rationalize when a child is born that has significant medical needs or is born with a disability? What do we say to either the teenager or the young mom who gets cancer way before their time? And how do we rationalize when our parents either get diagnosed with Parkinson's or dementia and we slowly have to watch as they deteriorate from the person that we used to know into somebody that we don't even recognize? What possible reason could there be for that, for that type of suffering that clearly doesn't seem to be brought on by the people themselves? You see, whether we like to admit it or not, we all desperately want to believe in karma, some sort of hidden code to the universe that helps explain why everything happens, that everything has a reason. And that's when our bad theology can hurt people badly. That sometimes the phrases that we deploy to try to comfort other people's and sometimes to comfort ourselves end up making things worse. I had a friend whose sister got cancer when she was in her early 20s. And she was from a faithful family, a good Christian family that went to church every single week. And uh, to the church's credit, they all did the Christian and faithful thing that they surrounded them with so much love and support and care that they did prayer visits and they gave them meals and they would visit with the family. And in the middle of it, they would try to comfort my friend and her family by saying, look, God has a plan. God is going to get you through this. You just can't see the reason yet. But my friend's sister ended up passing away. And that's when the pain of her loss ended up getting exacerbated by these people who still held on to this theology of everything happens for a reason. That for some people, even in the benign saying, look, God just needed another angel, was hard to hear for somebody to say, look, I needed my sister here now. Why did God need her? And sometimes even more toxic, there was this idea that God would have healed her sister if they would have just had enough faith. And, and people who said, look, if you would have only had more faith, maybe your prayers would have worked. And we can wound people who are already hurting and suffering badly when we try to fit this theology of everything happens for a reason into boxes where it is not meant to go. I am inspired in some ways by the work of Kate Bowler, who wrote a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. That in Kate's story, uh, Kate was somebody who uh, seemed to be getting her life all together in her mid-30s, that she had married her high school sweetheart, and even though it took them years of trying, they eventually got pregnant with their first child. And she had grinded through graduate school getting her PhD in history with a focus in Christian history specifically. She'd just written a book called Blessed in which she had gone around and she had studied the history of the American prosperity gospel. This idea that if you name it, you can claim it. If you believe it, you'll receive it. And that God blesses good Christians with health and wealth in response to their faithfulness. And she said, even though she was doing this academic study of people, and recently because of her work, she had gotten her dream job as a professor at Duke University, she didn't realize how much she subscribed to this ideology until something bad happened to her. That as she was 35 and at home with a one-year-old, she started feeling pains in her stomach and ended up going to the hospital and got a battery of tests done, and for a long while, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And eventually, on a fateful day, one of the tests came back positive, and a nurse called her up and broke the news to her that she has stage four cancer, and they needed her to come to the hospital immediately. And Kate realized later that her response was indicative of saying even though she tried to distance herself from all this prosperity gospel preaching that 
It was a lie that she actually had loved herself in her response. Because what she told the nurse, her very first response was, but I have a son. And as she reflected, why did I say that? She said, look, I think that tacitly I believed that because I had worked hard for my degree, but because I had loved people well, because I was a Christian, and because I was a mom, all of that should have disqualified me from ever getting sick. But it didn't. That I wanted to believe that all the good that I had done would be like a boomerang, that if I just threw it out into the world, it would come back to me. And yet here I was with stage four cancer, facing the prospect of dying. And I think that many of us are in a similar position as Kate, that even though we want to say, well, we're not like those people, we don't think like them, we may not believe in a God that gives us health and wellness in exchange for our faithfulness, but so many of us secretly think that God won't let bad things happen to people who don't deserve it. That we want there to be some sort of hidden code that we can tap into, some cosmic knowledge that we can know that means that we are insulated from all of the bad things that could happen to us. And as Kate was getting sick and she was interacting with people, the conversations that she had, she often found very unproductive with people who held this everything has a reason type of thinking behind it. Because all those same people said, look, God has a plan, or what did you do in your life to, you know, to bring this on yourself? And all of those things hurt. Some people even said as she was starting to write about it and write about her experiences having cancer, there were some people that said, you know, wow, I see the reason why you got cancer. That because of your story and the way that you've shared it with others and have brought so much hope to other people, that's why God made this happen in your life. And Kate just looked at those people and said, what are you telling me that God gave me cancer so that I could comfort other people who God gave cancer to? That doesn't seem like a very kind and loving God to me. And when people would come up to her husband and say, look, we may not know it now, but you know, everything happens for a reason, he would look at them and he'd say, well, what is it? And watch as they would get uncomfortable because they didn't have the answers, even though their phrase made it seem like they did. And one of Kate's insights was that sometimes in the interactions, as people were trying to comfort her, she realized that many of the people were not actually trying to comfort her or her husband, but were instead trying to comfort themselves. That these people weren't necessarily looking to bring comfort into her life, but instead to say, look, if everything happens for a reason, and there's a reason why you got sick, then there must be a reason why I'm not sick right now. There must be a reason, maybe I, you know, am good, or this is not God's plan for me, and that's why I'm not sick and you are. And so we have to ask ourselves, when we deploy this phrase, everything happens for a reason, do we do it to comfort others, or do we do it to comfort ourselves? Do we want to believe in this idea that our loved ones are not suffering in vain, or do we believe that, you know, we want to insulate ourselves from the idea of this ever happening to us? And this is in part why we need to look to Jesus and to see how he responds. That Jesus responds so differently than the way we do when sickness and suffering happens. That back in Jesus' day, that people thought that everything that happened did happen for a reason. And specifically, that your physical body was a manifestation of your moral choices. And Jesus takes times to challenge our assumptions around sickness. And so there's this story from John chapter 9, which is one of our accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, in which this happens. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why? Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? You see, Jesus' own disciples were asking the same question that we were, that we do, 
that we want to know why. We want to know the reason that something bad has happened. And sometimes we make a false dichotomy. Do we say, is it because of this person's sins? Was it because of his sins? Did he do something wrong to deserve this? Or maybe his parents did something wrong to deserve this. And Jesus' response is very telling. Jesus responds, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. That Jesus quickly bats down this idea that there is a correlation and a causation between our moral uprightness and our righteousness and whether or not we get sick. Now, in this second part of this answer, I don't do this often, but in this situation, it feels a little necessary, which is to question the work of the person who is doing the translating here. Because when you read this, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. I think it leaves us with the impression that God caused this man to be blind only so that we could see how powerful God is later. But when you dig into the Greek, that's not necessarily what Jesus is saying. And so uh, it is interesting that even in the work of translation, sometimes we impart our own theology of everything happens for a reason. That this line, this happened, this justification, this reason actually doesn't appear in the Greek. The only thing that appears is the word for but, which is all. And even this phrase, the power of God, doesn't quite accurately describe what Jesus is saying, which is, so that the work of God could be seen in him. You see, Jesus is not making a causal relationship. He is not connecting these two ideas of saying, well, it's not this, but it is this. Jesus is saying, no, 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 it is not either of these things, and yet, but... This is the work of God, that this man might be healed and that you might see the work of God in him. Because God doesn't dole out sickness as punishment, and God doesn't use sickness as an object lesson. God isn't there saying, look, if I just test them, they're going to learn the right lesson. If I just make this person sick, then they will be able to witness and testify to this other person who I've also made sick and suffering. God does not work like this. And Jesus tries to point us to a better way of understanding who God is and by pointing us to the work of God. That God's work is in healing and restoration. That in a moment you'll get to see Jesus heal this man who was born blind. And you'll get to see that God's work is not one of causing suffering, but one of causing restoration. So Jesus says, while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he does something that is really strange. And I still have no idea why he does it this way. But it says that then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man washed and came back seen. Jesus' response is not to give the people an answer for why this happened, but said, look, with this situation, God is still working. That because I am the light of the world, this man will be able to see that God's work is healing and restoration. Now there's another story that helps us understand God's relationship with us when we are dealing with sickness and with suffering. And that story comes from the resurrection of Lazarus, uh, which comes from John 11, which is just two chapters after this one happens. And I don't have the space to read the whole story in its entirety, so don't get thrown off that We'll kind of skip around a little bit to hit the main points in the story. But it says that a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now, the interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't immediately jump up and say, 
my friend is sick, I have to go right now and run towards where he is staying. But instead, Jesus takes his time. That he lingers for a day making preparations and eventually sets out. But by the time he gets there, it says this, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Oh, clicker. There we go. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. And the response to Jesus coming after Lazarus had died is evident in the expression and the reaction of the two sisters. That when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many of us have ever felt this way before, that when somebody gets sick or when somebody passes away, we immediately ask the question, God, where were you? Why didn't you answer my prayer? Why did you come late? God, if you were only here in this situation, maybe this person that I loved wouldn't have gotten sick. Maybe they wouldn't have passed away. And when we begin to think like that, we begin to imagine God as being cold and callous and apathetic to our sufferings. That God doesn't actually care about us being sick. And that God is somehow aloof or late. And yet, the way that Jesus responds to Mary and Martha is not one of callousness, of being separated from human beings, but instead it says that Jesus responds this way. When Jesus saw her weeping, meaning Mary, and saw the other people waiting with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Jesus' response to hearing that Lazarus had passed away and to see his two friends, Mary and Martha, weeping and angry and crying is not to say, don't cry, I've got this. But instead, his response is to weep with them. That when you are struggling because you are sick or because somebody you love is sick and it causes you sadness and anger, our God weeps with you. Our Jesus feels the same pain and emotions with you. That God does not delight in our suffering or is apathetic or doesn't care, but he weeps with us, is angry with us. And so know that when you weep, Jesus weeps with you. And Jesus is so moved by this moment in his emotional state that he begins praying to God and it says, Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here, so they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave cloths, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Jesus responds to their grieving by resurrecting Lazarus. And Lazarus comes out not in some sort of new body, like a shiny new car, but instead comes out with all the marks of having been sick. That his feet were bound in grave cloths, his face wrapped in a head cloth. That the scars and wounds are still there, and yet Jesus brings new life. And for many of us, it will be the same. That Jesus doesn't take away the pain or the hurt that we've been through or the marks that we have been sick, but Jesus does offer us new life.
just like Lazarus. Now the hard thing is that you might still be wondering, this doesn't help me. I'm still looking for a reason why. Why is it that the blind man gets to be healed? And why is it that Mary and Martha get to see their brother resurrected, but I didn't get to see my brother resurrected? Where was Jesus' healing for me? Why did this happen? I wish I could tell you, but I don't know either. And the truth is that we may never know the reason why people get sick, but that's not our job to figure out why, but instead to point people to the reason that we have hope, which is that we believe in a Jesus whose work is so much better than we can imagine, whose work is to bring healing and hope and resurrection into our world that we point to Jesus as the reason for our hope because we trust in God's work in this world. That just as Jesus said, look, God did not cause this sickness to happen, but God's work is in restoring what has been broken. That we can trust in God's work. That God's work for us is hope. God's work for us is to point us that, look, there is new life available for us, not only in this life, but in the next life. That God's work for us is healing. That our God doesn't see us in our sickness and suffering, in apathy, but weeps with us and desires to bring healing for us. And that God's work is resurrection. That the same God who went into the grave for three days and came back out is proof that we will be resurrected as well. You see, the part in the story that I glossed over is that Martha and Jesus have a conversation in which Jesus asks her if she believes in resurrection. And she says, well, of course I believe in resurrection. I I believe that you're the Messiah and in the last days everybody will be raised. And Jesus says, no, 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 but do you believe in resurrection now? And as if to show her that the promise of resurrection at the end of life is possible, he says, watch this, and resurrects Lazarus. This is the promise and the hope that our God is bigger than our sickness and our God is bigger than our suffering. That he desires resurrection and new life for each and every one of you and for the people you love. That our God is hope and our God is new life. Amen. Let's pray. God, we try to come before you with humility knowing that even though we want answers for why, we want everything to have a reason that we don't always know the answers. God, we ask that you give us a place in which when other people are sick and suffering, that we might be humble enough to respond the way that Jesus does. That instead of coming up with reasons that we might be angry with them, that we might weep with them, and that we might comfort them not with our words, but with our presence. God, we ask that you help us to trust you, that we might have hope in your work, which your work is healing and your work is resurrection, giving people new life where there is suffering and pain, that you promise us new life in the next one and in this one. So God, help us to see you. Help us to see the ways that you are working. And help us to be the type of people who glorify your name by responding the way that Jesus does. We love you so much and it's in your name we pray.